listening to the PR Wind Down Podcast, the show for public relations professionals who are ready to see real change in the PR industry. We are your hosts, April White and Laura Schooler. Let's get ready to wind down. You ready to rock? Yes. Are you ready to rock and roll? <laughs> Hello, Cleveland. <laughs> okay. So let's start off today with what not to do from PR pros who know. And this week's what not to do is don't give away the farm in new business pitches. Which is almost literal when it comes to you, April. (laughs) (laughs) Do not start handing your goats and your dogs to people. In new business pitches. Right. That would not not be effective. Yeah, this is a really hard one though, but you do have, so here it's hard because you want to make sure that the potential client that you're pitching believes that you are experienced and know what you're talking about. So when you give them a proposal and talk through it, you want to make sure that they know that you're like super smart and they can't live without you. Yes. And that you can produce results. But on the other hand, you don't want to give them the roadmap by which they either take it in-house for free or hand it to a cheaper (laughs) person now or or agency. Now, what they usually learn after the fact is that person in-house or the other agency can't execute on your strategy because it's your strategy Mm -hmm. and it's not cheap for a reason. However, I'm sure it's worked at least to some degree many times. So what do you do? It's a very good question. I even had a client once who, after looking at our proposal, took the proposed media list, right? Because we, this is back when I used to include a media list as not, a, not with contacts and not with names, but right. the names of the outlets that we would pitch. Yep. And I used to, you know, go to great lengths to basically create their standard media list, media list right. minus the contact information and include that in the proposal. Well, I quickly learned that then clients would go and try to pitch all those people themselves because quite frankly, it's not very difficult to find people's email addresses if you're savvy enough to do so, even without Cision, right? I had a a prospect who took the media list, went and pitched himself, only got one hit, but was happy kind of with the one hit, but then came back and wanted us to do the launch. Was like, you did the launch you just killed yourself you killed you shot yourself in the foot and you had no idea you're doing it because you thought it was so easy and then we were trying to you know move forward with this brand new announcement for this great platform that he'd already spilled the beans on (laughs) so i mean and then it was an upward battle the whole way from there i had another client prospect prospect client not client that I gave something to and he kept wanting me to talk through it. We'll talk through how this would work. We'll talk through how that would work. Huh. Well, would you do this first or this first? Well, and then it was all of this hemming and hawing and I took it as him being uncomfortable and needing me to hold his hand through it. And no. then it was very obvious to me afterwards <laughs> taking that I was all of your expertise, right? Yeah. That's 100% what happened. Wait, that you were what? What what words did you say? I said I I was the bumpkin. Bumpkin, yes. Yeah. So what happened with that? He just took your advice and ran and he never hired you? He never hired me and I never knew why. He was so excited about it. I talked to him multiple times and then he probably hired somebody cheaper. Probably hired like a freelancer for 3,000 a month or something. Well, so I find that on the ones that I'm like, oh, this person's not going to do that. I'm, you know, 80% in the door already. Like this is just, so I can give them the plan. Those are the ones that never, never convert. Never convert. Yep. And I think it's probably because of what you say. They're trying to get as much information out of you so that they can do their own thing, whatever that might be without you. On a recent one that, I thought was going to turn into a client that didn't, I actually did not give the whole plan. I gave more than I should have, but again, how do you, when you're, when you don't know which way it's going to go, how do you 
give just enough but not too much right so do you have what, what's the answer april i need it i actually started so i had this happen another time after i'd been burned a couple of times and mm -hmm. i had a client a prospect again come and start asking me questions and okay well we did, let's what what would we do for the first i'm not really clear on how this would work still I would like the first 90 days, like what we would do in what order. <laughs> and I said, well, at the risk of sounding rude, that's something we would develop upon signing the contract because it's, 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 it's paid work. It would take too many hours. It's too involved. And it's the kind of thing where, you know, frankly, I've been burned before and I've had clients. I'm saying not that I'm in any way saying that you would do this. I know you wouldn't. But, you know, I've had this happen before where I lay out the whole strategy and tell them how to do it. And then they just never hire me. I said, you know, I, I hate to be rude, but I just am not comfortable giving you that. And then they didn't end up signing. So they may have been offended by that. But Maybe. my guess, uh, my guess is more so that they just wanted to figure out if they could do it themselves. Yeah. And if I could talk them through how I would do it for free so that or they could do it. somebody told them what they thought and they wanted to see if it matched to what you thought and then they could hedge their bets or whatever. So the thing, I think that you can say to prospects, <clears throat> and I think this might be partially a female thing because you want to be nice and, mm -hmm. and explain. You could just be like, um, I can't give you that because that is actually a big part of what we get paid to do. Our strategy yep. is our bread and butter. And you right. don't have to I'm sorry I got burned and I, you don't have to say it sounds but you don't have, right. it's not it's business what dude right. would no dude would never apologize for that no you're right and you just gotta you just gotta sort of like inside and be like you know I can't give you that because that's a big part of what we get paid to do right well no and, and there's I mean I've been doing this for 20 years for me to just hand over a strategy that's right. that's intellectual capital that I can't just hand over would you just walk into the doctor's office and say can you just quick tell me is this cancer <laughs> right I mean for free just and then I'll die an MRI and let's see I'm I'll just kidding this myself if you just tell me how you would diagnose it that's right. what they're asking. Right. Right. Or a lawyer, right? How would you yes. go about this case? What would you draft? Right. Which motions and which order? Right. And then can, I, can I file it. a lawsuit? And if so, how would I go about doing that with this? Yeah. It wouldn't it's, happen. It wouldn't happen. So I still agree with our premise that do not give away the farm, but I'm still not sure. And I don't know if anybody ever has. How do you get to the right balance? So I like to tell them the tactics that we would use. Mm -hmm. I like to tell them which tactics we would use the first month as an example against our point system, which is unique to trust relations. And then I like to let them know essentially how we would go about doing those things without giving them a lot of specifics. So I know some agencies like to put storylines in there and they'll draft it out. Okay. These are the, these are the angles we would take and here's who we'd pitch it to. And they give examples mm -hmm. of those things. Some agencies say, here's all our big, our biggest creative ideas. And, you know, and sometimes as part of an RFP, you actually have to do that to be competitive. So we all know that the, when, whenever a client puts out an RFP and different agencies respond, that whatever ideas are in all of those proposals will be given to whoever the, the winner of the proposal is, right? That agency by default gets the best ideas that came from those RFPs to work with. Although the client's never going to say that's where they came from. It's going to be the, the, the client had ideas. What about this? What if we tried that? What do you think of this? And I have even had prospects that end up um, bouncing ideas off of me that other PR firms have pitched. Well, the, if somebody suggested this to me, what do you think? So you that, mean as they're trying to decide who to choose yeah. to be their AOR? Okay. I've had that happen too. So I think it's a, I think it's a really fine balance. I think the thing that I have learned is that when there's too many questions about exactly how it's going to work and exactly which order that I it's time you you should definitely have a 
a red flag raised, right? And start looking around and right. saying, okay, what are my spiny senses telling me? Do I need to tell them we've had enough conversations now? Sign or, you know, sign on the line or, you know, or walk away, which yeah. obviously I mean, you're never going to say that rudely, right? But, but there's a point at which it's like, how many conversations can you have with the prospect right, before, right. It, before it's, you know, a complete waste of your time? Because especially if you're billing it 150 an hour, 200 an hour, 100 right. an hour, whatever it is, right? As a senior person. <laughs> that's, Spending four or five hours doing this. I they've mean, taken $500 of your time. It's even like just like a relationship with a human being. Like you sort of know right away. And if it's hard or it takes too long or there's too much back and forth and then the, the other party is just, they're doing something else. Well, and to your point, even if it doesn't mean they're trying to do it on their own, if you have to have that many conversations with a prospect, that's very indicative of the kind of client they're going to be. Like not decisive and yes. so needing I a lot had... of hand-holding and want a meeting every, you know, three days. Yep. Too much, too many times, you know? It's too much back and forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think we covered it. Let's move on. So one of the things that I think is big news in PR for 2021 is the rise of substacks. And essentially what this is, Laura, do you want to do you want to do the honors and explain for our listeners who well, aren't what I what they think, are? I feel like it's the newsletter version of podcasts. That's a that's a really good summary. I like that. So essentially what's happening is that reporters are leaving mainstream outlets or even in some cases their own independent outlets going out on their own and and starting to write for people that sign up for subscriptions so the big 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 news that happened recently was glenn greenwald who's of course very famous for breaking the snowden story he was actually in the documentary so he's got a track record of being a very serious journalist who breaks incredibly daring stories and he recently was he started the intercept after leaving some other mainstream outlets i think he used to be at slate and some other places and and eventually he he started his own outlet well then what happened is he went to write an article about the mainstream media's failure to cover the hunter biden laptop story which he saw as because they were saying, oh, there's not enough evidence. There's not really a way to prove this. And right. of course, as a journalist who knows exactly what's required to pursue a story, he was like, crying foul, right? Like, the, the, what are you talking about? Like, go there's find so, out. There's so much information here by comparison to other things that you've covered the hell out of. So this right. is a double standard that doesn't... So in his mind, it was just like, what in the hell is going on? with the mm -hmm. media, he wrote a story about it. Mm -hmm. He got so censored by his own news outlet that he left it and he quit and he started his own sub stack. And he had, you know, you could sign up for $150. You could be a founding member, 150 bucks a year, or it's $50, I think, for a normal member. Mm -hmm. And then what he does is if you're on his newsletter, then you get his reporting so all of these detailed stories he's doing and right now boy, they are real interesting <laughs> i mean as you can imagine mm -hmm. so he's doing his own thing matt taibbi is doing the same thing as well he's obviously very famous from being at rolling stone and both of them are incredibly i mean talk about like setting new standards for journalism right these are guys who are really the watchdogs of society and they're going out and they're pounding the pavement and they're covering the hell out of stuff i would argue that they're doing it with as much integrity for the pursuit of the, of the craft and of the truth and of the story as I've seen most people doing now, right? Because mm -hmm. as we talked about before, there's a lot of like clickbait influences and there's a lot of social media buzz influences and there's a lot of advertising dollar influences. And so I think what's interesting about this Substack development is that these reporters are not beholden to anybody but themselves right? So their own standards, their own sense of the truth, their own sense of being the watchdog of society as, you know, God intended journalists to be in their mind and as, and as what it was set out to be, right? Um, right. Like, right. Non, non, like non-propaganda, totally right. objective reporting. So 
I think there's going to be a lot more of that happening, frankly, because I do think the the pressures that I mean, and some of the things you saw in this research that we did on Substacks is that a lot of people are feeling pressure, right, uh, from the different outlets to write a story with a headline that's going to be social media right. buzzworthy or that's right. going to make the top 10 list of the social media you know share share right, they're trying to sell advertising <clears throat> against it or whatever yeah i think this is an important thing to watch what i'm curious about is how in the world do you pitch substack reporters that's where i'm really interested right do you yeah i think you would have to really do your homework and make sure that you knew what kinds your of subject and the your yeah. subject what they like to cover it would be I mean, like an academic anyway. it would yeah right well you know what now that you say that it's the way every reporter should be approached right right but so, because yeah. of the nature of what the business has turned into it doesn't really work that way as much as it should or used to mm -hmm. also in those articles you know npr i think that a story in vanity fair some of them were talking about how it's reminiscent of like these penny newspapers from like back in the, I don't know, 1800s or whatever, mm -hmm. where there was a ton of different, and I kind of remember that I took a class when I was in college called the Urban Political Machine. Mm -hmm. And it talked about like Chicago, Boston, New York, and how these political bosses ran, you know, their wards and stuff. And they all had like basically their own newspapers and I think they were probably these penny papers so there was it wasn't just the New York Times and the New York Post it was like you know eight different newspapers in New York City right and they were all cost a penny and they were sort of propaganda machines but they had real you know reporters and real journalism because it wasn't you know it was a long time ago before advertising had controlled the whole entire world right so it was still like with the the sense of like we're gonna you know, the muckracking stuff and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of going back to those days. And then they, so they really are trying to use these, these newsletters to have a better business model where they're not incentivized by the wrong thing. Well, and my guess is that it's a lot more lucrative. I mean, if, how well, that's many, what I read. So, right? some, like, some woman is making like over $200,000. Apparently Substack takes 10% and then some other, some other thing takes one or three percent. But this woman said that she uh, usually is used to making 75 grand, which is the sad state of like a top journalist makes. And she's now making a little over 200 grand. Right. And I bet you if Glenn Greenwald's doing, you know, how many founding members were so excited to see real journalism that they probably gave him 150 bucks, 50 bucks. How many of those do you need before you're really rolling in it? I mean, he's probably doing pretty well now. Right. He's probably doing a lot better than he was even with his own outlet. So, and same with Matt Taibbi, right? I right. mean. But they are asking people to pay. So there was a good quote in, in an article about it that said, quote, this might be Substack's most important service by explicitly asserting that good journalism and commentary are worth paying for. Substack might help retrain web audiences who are accustomed to believing information is free. I think that's really smart. Yeah. And I think for people who really want to know what's going on in the world, I mean, that's, it is worth paying for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, and you don't, frankly, I mean, some of the, the, I think the distrust of the mainstream media stems from the fact that it is paid for by ad dollars, which are paid for by the biggest corporations, corporations. which have definitely a, have agendas, right? So, I mean, I even remember Des Moines Register when I was working there, Starbucks came to town and because of the Starbucks ad dollars, they made it front page news <laughs> and we were furious. Like the staff members that were there were like, what, how is that front page news? Are you out of your mind? That is because not- they're opening a Starbucks? Is not A1. That's like on the, below the fold on the, on the business page. That's where it should be. Right. But it wasn't, it was on the front page. Right. And then that's a, some, you know, a small like Midwestern newspaper that doesn't have that much well, money fly, flying around. Could one map right. the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or Forbes or Fortune or Business Week or mm -hmm. Box Business or. Yeah. We're all, I mean, I'm even a little naive to that, even though I work sort of in, you know, the industry regarding like that something may not get covered because of financial reasons, you know, and the reporter's telling you some BS reason why your story got cut, but it might be because somebody else 
like Starbucks was coming to town. But you know, a lot of those, you know, I love the local news. And, and I think I said something to you the other day about there, there might be the rise of some local news again, like, like big companies, you know, or bigger companies buying small local, because yeah. sometimes those little papers are the ones that break big stories that turn into national news. We don't want to put down, was it the Des Moines Register? So I'm a fan of the local media and now I will hopefully become a fan of these newsletters. But yes, it's almost like trying to probably to pitch The Economist or Barron's, right? It's like so not easy to do, but- you know, And they write very, I mean, at least right. the that I've subscribed to are very long form. These are in-depth art. I mean, I think the Glenn Greenwald, the last one, let me, let me just, 12 pages. Wow. Hey, Laura, is this our guest driving? It's Michael, right? It is, I hope so. All right, cool. Today on the PR Wind Down, we're welcoming Michael Reich from Dead As We Know It, creative agency in Brooklyn, Williamsburg. He's here to discuss how he got into the field, typical client challenges, how he sees ads and PR working together, and a whole bunch of other stuff. He uh, is the executive creative director and owner at Dead As We Know It, and he was formerly the creative director of New York agencies Mad Dogs and Englishmen. I've heard of them. Are they still around? I have heard of them. And yep. Mad Injection. Yeah, that was my, uh, yeah, Mad Dogs and Englishmen was, I was a founding partner in that in, you must were? have been 1992. Were then, you on Bowery? Nope. Well, we started out on, was it 11th Street? And then we moved up to 18th Street and 5th Avenue. And then we moved to Park Avenue Were South. you in the in Max's Kansas City building? Or no? Yes. No, we were, we were close by, but not exactly. I worked in that building at a PR firm that? for a minute. Yeah, I think I tried, not that I ever did advertising, but I think I tried to like get a job at Mad Dogs, but I was not cool enough. I did so too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't cool enough either. <laughs> and now, okay, this whole interview is going to be different than I thought. It was going to be nice. <laughs> I think it is. Nobody was cool in the <laughs> uh, Yeah, no, that was, um, yeah, that was, well, I could tell you all about it, but yeah, I was there for 14 years. It was the, and do you want to hear my whole story? The whole, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. So my background is when I came to the city, like 87, 88, I was doing theater and I came, I was just living in the East Village and I was just doing downtown theater. I was directing and acting and, and I was in a ska band, just kind of living in a shitty apartment and, and just That's down what there. people did. But, so I was living down there and I was doing experimental theater. Well, that was my background. I was directing and I was acting and um, having a great time. I was doing improv and just that's really what I was about. Uh, and I was also in a ska band uh, at the same time. So I was doing both of those and just having a good time. And- uh, But wait, wait. At, you weren't just in a ska band. I was, I was in- You were in a, a like known <laughs> ska band. Yeah, we were we were we were the, we were the well, top in this very small field. Yeah, but it was it was during during ska's heyday. Yeah, the, it was a satanic ska band called <laughs> Mephistopheles. So, but that was a blast. So I was doing both of those at the time, uh, and and then there was an actress that was in one of the shows that I was directing. Her husband was he was a creative director at Shiat Day, you know, which was a big agency. Yeah. Back in the time, the day. And you said, I have to get a real job one of these days or what? I really wasn't actually looking for a job. I was really, I was waiting tables and stuff. And he was working there and I used to just hang out with him and during the show. And, and, and actually in the show that I directed, I was starting to, cause it was all this Russian stuff. It was like written in like 1919 or 20 something. And, and I had like, I, I started bringing all these like creating logos within the show. And it was all about, I made it all about kind of marketing the soul. And I brought in all these sort of marketing things. Cause that was just my, that was just my aesthetic and stuff. And he was like, you know, you'd be really good in advertising. And I was like, really? I was like, I don't know about it. He said, why don't you come in and you could just kind of hang out and see what we're doing. So I started doing that. And he was at Ogilvy at the time. So he'd come over to Ogilvy from Shiat. And uh, I was just like hanging out, watching what they were doing. Uh, and he said, if anybody wants this brief, they could do it. And I got a, the brief I had was for Reese's peanut butter cups. I was just like, oh, this is just fun. So I just started coming up with ideas and I was never a writer. I never really wrote anything. And I never saw myself as a writer. I was an actor and I could do characters and come up with ideas. So I just started 
doing characters and funny thoughts and just, you know, kind of doing the characters and then writing what, you know, what I thought the characters would say on paper. And they ended up buying some of the work I presented and I ended up producing work even before I had a job. So I kind of fell into it backwards, but I, I really wasn't looking for a job. It was, and I just saw it as like, wow, instead of doing, creating like two hour plays, I could do 30 second ones and have fun with characters and storytelling. And, and there's a lot more money going into them than the plays that I was directing and a lot more people were seeing them. So I was like, this is a lot more fun. So um, did you get hired there full time? Yeah, yeah. I got, I remember uh, I was, uh, it was 1990. I actually remember I, I took, I went to Hershey, Pennsylvania to Hershey's to present my Reese's peanut butter cup spots. And while I was there, the account person, you know, heard that I, I didn't really have a job there. I was just like an intern. Uh, and he was like, oh, that's really interesting. Okay. He said, don't, don't tell the client that because that's, so I didn't realize I was doing something really verboten <laughs> for, for this thing. But right, it's they, because they're, they're paying their account people like hundreds of thousands of dollars and none of them can do anything at all. They were ineffective and they bring you in and they probably gave you like 10 bucks an hour. <laughs> I wasn't even getting that. I was, <laughs> I was having a great time and I was like, so anyway, funny. so they, so then they, they hired me. Right. I got my big, I remember my first paycheck. They were like, you're going to get $25,000. And I remember just going 25,000. I was picturing a room filled with 25,000. <laughs> I was going to roll in it. And that was going to be my dream. Like Daffy Duck or something. Oh, I was like, I never like see. And then of you're course. Like swimming. Like, oh, I was like, yeah. <laughs> And just the so idea. how long did you stay there? I was there for a year. Oh, and then what did you do? Well, then, um, then what happened is the guy that brought me in, that was the, the husband of the actress that, you know, that brought me in, mm -hmm. uh, he left after a year because he was like, you know, fed up with the bureaucracy or, you know, with a big mm -hmm. agency. And he said, I'm going to go start my own agency. And his name was Nick Cohen. And um, it was called Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Oh, so, that was, he started this firm and you like went with him? To be honest, what happened is he left the agency and also right at the time, I think Ogilvy lost like a load of business and they just, they, they laid off a lot of people. Oh. It was also for me, this whole idea of having different teams. Well, first of all, just the term team like denotes sports. And it was like, and we're having a creative shootout. So you're going against this team and this. And I really hated that too, because I saw that happen when you like, I get, really competitive and you really want to win and then you don't win and you're like it was just very I don't know suddenly I, I went from being a creative where we're all working together and trying to do something great together to suddenly like I'm on some game show I don't like being competitive and I don't like losing and I just find <laughs> you know just so found, you don't like to be competitive but if you are competitive you better effing win this yeah, basically yeah. Where you're <laughs> but basically I just don't like I don't like losing <laughs> I would, so you don't uh, want to even go there because you're going to yeah. have a heart, right? Okay. So, well, it's funny because April and I have talked amongst ourselves and to a couple of people we've interviewed recently, uh, PR guys who don't like the team mentality in PR because they think that it takes away from the actual people who are really doing the work. Yeah. So the whole team gets credit, even though it was only one or two people who actually like did anything and they're not getting any, you know, uh, acknowledgement. I don't yeah. know if that's what you're talking about, but yeah, I mean, it's, well, for me, it's more just like, hey, you, I mean, it's pretty much if you've teams, it's a game, right? So you've got three, four teams and you're saying, hey, everybody pitch me your best ideas. And then you're developing it with each one as a creative director. And then you're going in with this campaign or this campaign. And then, they, you know, which one gets picked is the one that wins or, or goes ahead. So it's definitely a way to do it. I, I find, you know, I feel like my job is to help hone a big idea, focus it and then try to find work that moves in that direction or focuses in that direction. And I feel like with a lot of agencies, there might not be that focus of this big idea or it might be like, hey, this is the brief. Now everybody hit me with a different way to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not so focused. And then you're kind of, it's a bit more of like a crapshoot of like, hey, let's do a few different ways and right. see Spaghetti which one. Spaghetti on the wall kind of thing. Yeah, and, and see which, you know, so to me, it's, I, I feel like, it's not such a creative direction job. It's more of a, a creative picker. So you stayed there for like 13 years, did you say? And then did you establish your, your own shop? Mad Dogs had started out, we were just like creatives and we were, you know, just working for, um, we started out just a few of us and working directly with clients and, 
and just doing stuff. And it wasn't, we weren't like this big agency process. We weren't trying to be that. But then we grew a lot bigger, especially with the dot com that made us grew up to like, I think 40, 50, 60 people at some point. After the recessions, you know, the second recession, this third recession happened, suddenly we were finding clients were coming to us, but they didn't have the money for the whole rigmarole. They'd be like, hey, I just want to run some ads. Or I want to do some stuff. And they were like, well, this is what we charge. It was the agency of record. We give you planning, we account servicing and media. You know, we, we, were, we were a small, bigger agency. It was the same mm-hmm. model. And people were just like, we really don't have that money, you know? <laughs> so we were, we were finding that we were like not getting a lot of business. We we're missing these big agency of record retainers. Given the, so what we're thinking about doing is selling the agency a little bit more a la carte. So you can get agency of record if you want. You get the whole kit and caboodle, the whole dinner special, or you can get planning if somebody just wants to come because some people were just saying, hey, we want to figure out who the brand is or who our target is. So we could just do planning division. Um, and we also thought we would do a division of people that just want some ads. So in and out. Um, and the idea was that I would run it separately. It was more, what, what can we do to help the, move this thing? You know, and- right. There's Some opportunity is- here and how do we zero in on it and how, how do we bring it to life or where do we put it? Yeah, exactly. And, and some of that is creative. Some of that is PR, you know, it's big, looking for a big idea. It's just- So that's a good, so that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. How do you see advertising and PR work together? And, and did you ever have opportunity to do that back then or now? I mean, I've never really worked hand in hand with PR people that I've had a really successful relationship with. And I, I think I mentioned this to you, it's just, and it's something that to me is so, would be so essential. And, and, and I'm not saying anything about PR firms or people. I, we haven't had that many chances, but my feeling is like, and you can, what, you can bad mouth them to us. It's okay. okay. Well, that was PR people. <laughs> and the, huh? No, it's, um, but I, I feel that because we've worked with a lot of our clients with very little money, you know, for me, the best advertising should generate PR. It's like the ideal ad should not have any media money behind it, you know? And I thought this before the internet, you know, this is like, was to be always the case. Nobody wants to spend media money. I have a good example. I think it was the Wall Street Journal or hold on, maybe the New York Times just did a huge story, I think yesterday, about, do you recognize this? The oh, Bed yeah. Bath & Beyond coupon. It's, they did a huge, I had no idea there was like this whole like decades. I was like, I thought I was the only one who had a stack like of 900 on my, in my kitchen in both of my apartments. And um, no, and so there was a whole huge story about it. There are people who write about marketing and advertising and there are huge stories and there's publications about i mean i used to do pr for marketing at when i worked at clear channel entertainment and we would get into brand week and to ad week and to ad age and you know all the things that we did there would become stories and you know because some of these ideas or creative themselves like that coupon is like an interesting enough like phenomenon that it turns into media coverage right I think that should be the goal of it. Why wouldn't any client want to not spend media money? Like that should just be a given. I mean, and if you could say- And media money on PR, you're saying? Well, spend it on doing creative that gets PR and having the PR people that can PR it. Because look, the, the best PR person can't take something that isn't interesting and make it interesting. I right. mean, maybe they could try, but. Wow, you're like you're light years ahead of a lot of people with that statement. Well, I, but I think that's right. I mean, and I'm sure PR people, like I'm sure that's your biggest issue. You're like, you're giving us something that isn't Not interesting. News, right. <laughs> we have to turn something into it. So, I mean, I think they have to work hand in hand, you know? Yeah. I was gonna ask about examples. I wanna hear about your most PRable yeah ads that you've ever done That's that got the point. most oh, media yeah. coverage? I mean, just going back to the Village Voice ads that we did back in the day, I mean, those got a lot of PR and those got picked up. 
um, especially in the, in the ad trades at the time. And those were a place that people went. So those really were like, just because they were, first of all, not just that they were cheap, but they were really kind of bad mouthing the village voice. They were very self deprecating and making right. fun of the kinds of people that read it. But it was in the spirit of what reader, uh, the readers of the village voice were really like too. So you exactly. hit it right on. And, yeah. And, and making fun of like that they were liberal or misunderstood or making yeah. fun of the people that would be that don't, you know, that don't read the voice. So right. it was really, I mean, we're trying to do stuff that was really simpatico with the reader. So that was one. Was there any like, you know, brand, like consumer product? I mean, we've done stuff for like, uh, well, when we ended up, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but when I started my agency, Dead As We Know It, we've done some stuff where for the, the Kraken spiced rum, basically our whole thing was we really saw our target as, as kind of like a small niche of like the cooler, darker people that love the anti-hero that were drinking or used to drink Captain Morgan. But these are like the cooler, darker people. So we saw right. every opportunity, what the Kraken would do as like subverting things. So we did this one thing where we bought some billboards in, I think it was Chicago. We made it look like a regular Kraken billboard with just a big bottle there. Then we had the Kraken, which of course is this giant, you know, it's this giant squid, mythical squid. And we had one of its tentacles actually leaving the billboard and we built a fake side of the building that looked exactly like the building with a brick and all and a window. And it was pulling a, a woman out. So it's a mannequin. <laughs> but it looked like it was like leaving the board and pulling her out. She's like, ah! And we had another uh, man <laughs> looking like it. And so it was really just kind of, you know, shocking and, and looked really like, you know, bursting out of its thing. And that, you know, this was in the age of the internet. People were putting stuff on it. It was on BuzzFeed before we could even PR it. And that got a lot of attention and right. stuff. Um, oh yeah, we've done, we did, we did a bunch of really controversial ads for Manhattan mini storage. We did, uh, oh shit, we did something actually for, it was for Macura and Marvel, where they just wanted some kind of really cool kit. Uh, we, we made it look like this, the test to be part of S.H.I.E.L.D., to be part of their secret organization. And you would take all these things and it had vials in it and different things that it had like a scorpion in a bottle. And we had all these funny things like, you know, that you were supposed to do just to see if you were, you know. See monkeys. Or something. But it was, yeah, it was like things, take this thing and put the scorpion on your tongue. If you're, right. you know, could hold it for, but it was all these like sort of tests of, of bravery and of strength and all these oh, things. And it was right. in this dark black box and it was sent out to, I think a lot of them were sent out to the automobile press. And I think somebody got one of these kits and they looked at it, I don't know, they thought it was cool or didn't. And then they, they put it in their trash and somehow it created a massive bomb scare. And somebody called it in. It was like half of Detroit cleared out due to these things. And we were like, so I don't know if that's good oh press or bad, but I think we shut <laughs> down a major area for, for a while. Oh um, my God, Un unwittingly, huh? That's funny. What are your biggest client challenges? Like, I, I would imagine, well, maybe maybe the kinds of clients that you get are open to this stuff, but is it hard to push this stuff through? Or, or is there other kinds of challenges that are more prevalent? I mean, obviously, we're trying to push things and we're trying to be as wild as possible. Or we, we're, we're looking not so much to be wild, but we're looking for stuff that people are going to talk about. There's, I think the biggest client challenge with all, with all clients, with all things, I think they are so set on making sure that an ad is somehow right, that it gets the product right or gets the, their messaging right or says right. the right thing. I, the way I see it is it's almost like a lot of clients see the advertisement. It's almost like doing a book report in school. It's like, I- This I book is everything. about- like I know, I know this book, I know this brand, I know its history, I know it all. And I just have to reflect that in the most correct manner. And I think that's the biggest problem. And I think it's important to get your brand spirit right and uh, you know ethos right. I think that's uh, you know the price of admission. And I think the, the important thing is, is like it's not about getting it right or about capturing it. Advertising or PR or any things that we do, it's a catalyst. It's there for a reason. It's to make something happen. It's to make people interested in it, to make people talk about it, to put it on the radar. And if it's not doing that, then we have done nothing. Then we've just done an, you know, a film that feels good to the company. And I think a lot of times they look at it and they go, yeah, this is, 
this reflects how we feel about the product. Right? right, and that kind of stuff should probably be at their like, you know, annual meeting, not a public advertisement, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think, yeah. I mean, and I think it's also reflects how they, how they want to think that the public are seeing it. They start, they kind of start out with, with A and think, well, how do we move that into B? Make that, what do we do with that? And, and my feeling is like, okay, well, you know what A is, which is your details and your product, you know what it is, you know what you want to communicate, but what is your C? What are you trying to accomplish? You know, where do you want to be? And then our job as advertising people and PR people as communicate is to create B. So my feeling is the biggest problem that a lot of clients have is they're not saying, hey, where do I want to be? What do I want to have happen? Rather than they're just like looking at the A and going, well, how do we do something with, you know, the stuff that we know to be true? You know, I, I mean, I, I kind of go back a lot to when you say with the biggest problem that clients have. And or your, yeah, the biggest challenge that you have. They're always like, hey, I don't want to really, I'm worried about taking chances with any advertising. And it's like, my feeling is always like, look, you're about to spend a few million bucks or whatever you're about to spend. But the biggest risk you have is not getting noticed is all that money going down the toilet. What, what is your other risk that you're going to go to jail or you're going to, I mean, I guess it's losing their job, but it's like, I don't think there's been a lot of ads or many that have like tanked a company. Do you have any favorite ads? I mean, I like these ones that really kind of, you know, different things that turn the corner. Like I remember the whole Xerox monk ad that ran, I think it only ran like once back in like the seventies. What was, was like, that? Oh, it's like, I'm, I'm so going to date myself with my original ads. It's like, then Henry Ford, he did his great ad. <laughs> well, it's a really famous ad. He cranked I'll, up the motor. Yeah. But it was, it was an ad at the time. I think it was, I think it started out with this like, man, you look like a monk, you know, his shaved head, round right. face, chubby guy. And I think he just kind of was very quiet, walking through a monastery. And you, oh, you hear all church music. He walks into the head deacon or, or head monk. And the monk says to him, he's like, I have a task for you. Um, we want you to transcribe all of the Psalms from this to that. And he like hands him this huge stack of papers, you know, huge. And he just looks sad. And then you just see him walking through the monastery with long, quiet shots and ends up in a room that's a Xerox. It's got a Xerox machine. And it was also, I think they were kind of a bit new at the time. And you just see him running all of these manuscripts through the Xerox machine. You know, the head priest and the priest looks at him and he's like, you're finished. It's a miracle. And you see this <laughs> priest look up to the God. But I think it, it was very famous at the time, but I think it only ran once and it got all this press. It's a pr you know, prime example and everybody knew it. It was kind right. of famous ad. And I think it's one of these things you find out later, oh, it only ran once or twice, but it got that kind of talk value. Right. Wow. It didn't, they didn't need to spend a lot of money on running it a lot because yeah, and somebody is, else did. A lot of people did it for them for free, right? And this is long before the internet. I think that right. was one. And then my other famous, my favorite ad is from that time period. I've had lots of ads since then, but was I remember coming into the city because I'm from Long Island, but I would come into the city and being on the subways. And I remember mm -hmm. the ads on the subway platforms where it was you don't have to be Jewish to eat Levy's, and it was pictures the of like bread. a Chinese man or. A, a Native American or a black person eating it. And there were these wonderful, wonderful portraits. And of course I'm Jewish. So I think they really connected with me. And I was like probably seven or eight and just going, and I still, I still look at them and I just like smile and, and just, just the photography was great and the casting and the expressions. And I still like, still think those are just such a gold standard and, and like really, I would say controversial, but in a very, endearing way so it wasn't trying to be you know risque or you know and i love that i love things that are really shocking in an endearing way right you know? to seeing the multiculturalism and just that kind of voice so mm -hmm. that but then i've there's been lots of ads i've loved over the years that people have done and so i find it interesting that you were not oh i want to be in advertising and yet you remember these two ads from when you were quite young. Mm -hmm. So it was that still is in your- Is that his DNA? This is gonna sound really pretentious, but like, I love like iconic things. 
mm. visually or sound or like I was really, you know, I was in a band and music. I love album covers. I love logos. I was really into punk and ska and I loved like all the artwork from all the, all the two-tone records or all punk logos with the Ramones. And, and, and I mean, just talking about PR, um, I was doing, you know, I came up with my band's name and theme and logo, which was Satanic Ska for the whole family. And we, our theme was Satanic Ska. <laughs> for the whole family. And Nephiscopheles, it was this pun on the devil's name. And, but I also knew that, like, hey, this is going to get PR. This is going to, people are going to have a story to write about. And right. I used to write all the press releases for it. You know, the way I thought of it is like, okay, there's, hundreds of writers sitting next to a computer looking for something to write. So the more you could kind of give them the story and help them and say, this is what it is and give them something, the more they'll be grateful and take it, take the ball rolling. So I was just thinking, these are also smart, creative people. So what's going to inspire them? So you've been doing, you've done PR. I don't think that's interesting. Yeah. And, and I just never thought of it as PR. <laughs> I just thought <laughs> I'd be, I just thought I was being pushy, but, but it was like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't like, let me run some videos. Let me run some money. We had no media money, zero. So it was getting picked up in magazines and getting run on MTV. I mean, we were looking oh. for free advertising and that's what that was and on radios. So, cause we were making our money in t-shirt sales. Right. That's amazing. Right. So how Merch. do you, how do you embody a brand? How do you come to the place where you know you got the book report right? We've actually developed a system here. Really? Um, yeah, we actually have a whole, I mean, it was really just the way I see things. And this is what Dead As We Know It is. We started this agency, you know, after Mad Dogs closed, because I really wanted to do something that was, I actually had a dream one night that I had an agency called uh, knobs, N-O-B-S, so it was no bullshit. I was like, how do we work directly with clients? How do we just get to the core of what it is? And, and our, the system that we do at Dead As We Know It is, we've got a whole process and we call it brand realization. And it really is, we see, um, without getting into all the details of it, but in, in its rawest form is what really identifies like our target as like one person, as a you know, human being. Who are they like? What are they like? And we try to get really specific and see them like as a, as a character, you know, just so we really could name that person. Like, who is that in a film? And all we even say, like, oh, who's that? And really get to know him. So it's not just like, he's a male, 25, with, you know, like, what is he, what is he into? What films does he or she into? What are they like? What would they, what kind of jokes would they make? You know, we'll quite often sit in the agency and go, you know, it's like, it's like Gwen, right? Oh yeah, or it's like Chris. Or, you know, we'll say that. So that'll be our person really identifying that. So we see that on one side uh, and we really boil it down to like, well, what, what drives them? Um, you know, what gets them out of bed? And I'll say, what is their driving force? You know, and it like might be like meeting chicks or it might be looking good or it might be, you know, getting rich. We really just try to boil it down. Like what's their driving force? But um, we also do it on the other side. We think about how do we turn our brand into a character and really what is their driving force and really think of them as a person and I know a lot of agencies will talk about this but we really try to boil it down to of your philosophy and your driving force so we really try to turn that into a character and really see the brand as a character because character from theater background is they say character is described as who you are is how you do what you do and that's what describes a character. Because once you know personality, everything falls into place and it's a no brainer. I think until brands figure that out, they've got nothing. And it's the mm -hmm. one thing that all great brands have in common. It's like, if you think about Apple, you have a very good sense of their personality and what feels right for them and what feels wrong or Coca-Cola or Levi's or any of these brands we take for granted that are just these monoliths. But but most brands don't, they think, oh yeah, well, they're like that because they've been around forever and they've done, it's like, no, somebody consciously made right. that happen. So do you have anything that you want to, you know, plug for your, for yourself, for uh, your company? If you can yeah. advertise for yourself yeah, right we're doing, now. We're doing lots of great stuff. You know, something. I mean, I'm, we're always looking for, you know, great clients that were really simpatico with and really you know are excited to work and stuff we work very personally and so i'm always looking for people that are excited i'm also looking you know we're looking for great 
people to hire and to work with, you know, on all sorts of levels. And, you know, we generally don't like have positions open, but when we meet exciting people that are passionate, somehow positions develop for them and roles. That sounds like April. That's how she approaches her company. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. She talks to like a ton of people and she wants to get everybody a job. So when, when something happens, like it might be a year later, she's like, wait a minute, I talked to Joe and he loves that. And like, she finds Joe and like brings it together. Yeah. But you know, and I, and I would love to find a way to partner with you. I think it'd be super fun to be able to PR some of those ads. And I'm obsessed with that idea. So if there's a way to, to team up on the PR and ad side, that would be incredible. Okay, this has been so fun. Thank you so for so much of your time. I know this has been oh, a, a big chunk of the afternoon, but or evening. No, I, for dinner. This is great. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. And stay in touch. Love it. Thank Bye, you, Michael. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. So should we move on to the horror story of the week? So we got a new one, which is always exciting. So here we go. In 2008, I got put on an account that was doing PR for a major tech conference. The director on the account literally walked to my cube and sarcastically told me to, quote, not show him up on the account. I'm sure he was sarcastic, but who the hell says says that to an account coordinator? Plus, I partially felt like he meant it. Anyway, this fueled me and I landed the client a video feature on Forbes They used to do video interviews back in the day and the client was hella happy. (laughs) Flash forward to the night before the conference's big first night and each team member checks into our own hotel rooms and get ready to meet with the client for dinner and drinks. It was cool getting to know more about my colleagues and client and understanding everyone from a personal standpoint, including hearing how the director was dating a ballerino, term for a male ballerina, I don't know if I knew that. Wait, so does that mean Barishnikov was a ballerino? I don't know. I just would call him a ballet dancer, I guess. Okay. At the tail end of the night, the team has a nightcap in the hotel lobby, minus the client. One by one, folks tap out and head to their rooms. I'm left with the director, and we're just shooting the shiz until he made a move on me. Awkward. Didn't he just say he was dating a ballerino? Anyway, he was touching my face, my arm, and complimenting me. I kept it professional and politely declined his advances. I told him I was leaving to get up for a local broadcast filming media op at 4 a.m. that everyone on the team had to be present for, including him. I remember calling my best friend about the odd situation, but had to move on because I had to be up early. Of course, the director missed the 4 a.m. TV filming and the VP on the account was pissed as F. The show must go on, right? We were so busy with the conference that I completely forgot about my director's advances. And in the midst of everything, our country was going through a recession. Sad face. (laughs) While we were at the conference, the agency held a mandatory meeting we all had to attend. We weren't privy to things going on in the office as we were down the street at the convention center, but the agency laid off a ton of people, including half my team managing the conference account. Fortunately, I was was spared, and it's crazy because I was one of the last folks to be hired at the agency. So usually last in, first out, not in this case. Interestingly, one of the folks that got let go was the director who made the move on me. That's probably why they didn't show up at the 4 a.m. Thing, I guess. Uh, a few weeks later, the first person I told of the agency about my situation was an SAE I was super close to, and we just couldn't get over how things in life just unfold. Maybe I should have, but I never bothered telling HR or any of my managers. I guess I just didn't know at the time how to navigate something of that magnitude, so I just stayed silent. So uh, I think we both assumed early on that this was a female who who wrote in. But I think that it was not a female who wrote in. I don't think it was either. (laughs) It's because we're so used to like 90% of PR people being women. Right, right, right. Um, That's insane. So gets hit on by the the account director. director who told him earlier not to show him up. 
then doesn't show up for the TV filming. We don't know if they were fired before or after that. And then this person never tells that they got hit on because the person's gone. So I guess it doesn't, what are you going to do by this point? But I'm wondering if the person got fired and that's why they didn't show up at that 4 a.m. thing or if, if they got fired partially maybe because they didn't show up at that and probably hadn't shown up in other things. And I just say that because our friend who wrote here, us here had just recently been hired. Usually it's about money though. So a director makes more money than a coordinator. So that's probably why they got let go, let's be frank. Yeah, I mean, especially if the coordinator was already doing a better job. Right. Which probably, if that person was insecure, that's the only reason you would even say something like that to an AC. Right. So if I you didn't think, think you were a good enough AD. Right. It's almost like, I don't want to just say PR agencies. I feel like it's agency, right? Weird things happen at agencies. I mean, they made a whole TV show about it, basically, Mad Men, right? At agencies. And like the nonsense that goes on. Shenanigans. The shenanigans. Either way, I guess since the person was let go and nothing like ended up transpiring, would you have reported it at that point? I mean, I probably wouldn't have, especially this sounds like it's a few years ago. I mean, I, I think, think the world has changed and people may now, but people didn't, especially like that then. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, normally we both say don't go to HR. In this case, that might be a situation. Oh, right? when I say don't go to HR, I usually mean when you know that you're getting railroaded or, or your boss is being mean or, or like asking crazy things. If you actually get hit on uh, like some sort of like harassment, sexual or, or otherwise, then you go to HR because then you have a legal standing mm -hmm. and they'll have to listen to you. Right. And there's nobody else who can really safeguard you in that in that regard. Mm -hmm. However, if that person was some real serious senior person, and maybe I'm naive to say until recently, HR probably wouldn't have helped you that much either. But now I feel like they, they err on the side of being overly cautious instead of trying to sweep something under the rug. No, you're right. Okay, so I think it's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in for the PR Wine Dump podcast. And many thanks to our guest, Michael, for joining us today. We had a very interesting interview. Very interesting. He's amazing. Remember to submit your own agency stories and questions. As always, we appreciate your support. So please share our show with your friends and colleagues. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating. And if you have an anonymous PR horror story ah, of your own, uh, send it our way at the contact <laughs> <laughs> send it our way at the contact email below the episode notes we can't wait to wind down with you again next week bye bye <laughs>